out of gas. Okay, here's my obligatory I lurk here all the time thing. I read this subreddit quite a bit. I've thought a lot about submitting my own experience, and now I finally am. In retrospect, things turned out fine, but it was really alarming for me at the time. I grew up in an extremely rural Midwestern state. My family lived in the country between two small towns. I had attended school in both small towns and knew most of the families in the area either by face or last name. One night, it was about 10 or 11, and I was leaving a high school basketball game in town A. I was about 15, and driving on my school permit pass curfew. I had borrowed my uncle's car, an early 90s Toyota, with a leak in the gas tank that caused me to run out of gas before I made it home, more than five or six miles out of town, and I had about seven left to go. I was on a long stretch of road that served as a shortcut between two main highways in the aforementioned towns, and it wasn't heavily traveled. There were a few houses, but they were stretched far apart, and at the time, cell phone reception was very spotty. I waited for a while, and finally a nice, newer red truck with an extended cab, a toolbox in the back, and a construction company logo on the side pulled up. It was a Friday or Saturday night, and there was a man inside with a woman and two girls. He offered me his cell phone. I remember noticing it was a track phone, which my friends and I referred to as the time as crack phones, because you can't trace the owners and they're frequently used by drug addicts. They're also used a lot by people who can't afford a standard phone plan. The family was driving a really nice vehicle, and they seemed super clean cut, so it struck me as odd. The phone got no reception. I tried calling my parents a few times and finally gave up. The truck had been heading away from town B towards town A, where I had just come from, so when they offered me a ride I thought nothing of it. I had a gas can in the truck and all my friends lived in town A, so I figured they could drop me off at the gas station on the way to their destination, and I could find a ride back with somebody I knew. When I got in the car, I was caught off guard by the way the woman and the two girls were dressed. Conservative families, even Amish and Mennonites aren't common where I'm from, but for the man being otherwise modern, wearing jeans, driving a sort of flashy truck, and owning a cell phone, the female's clothing surprised me. They all wore long, heavy skirts and buttoned-up blouses with thin bonnets on their heads. One of the girls seemed to have a disability and made grunting noises every so often. Other than her noises, the women were completely silent. Everything seemed fine to me until the man driving turned around and started driving the opposite way of the direction he had been driving. The closest town was the other way and still 15 or more miles, and it seemed out of his way. Out of politeness, I reminded him that I'd come from town A, knew everyone there, I could find a ride home. It was late and I figured he needed to get his family to where they were going. That's when he told me that he was from town B, and that he had a full gas can waiting at his house, and that he could take me and bring me back to my car to fill it up. Still trying to be polite, I told him it was unnecessary and my house was on the way to town B, just a few miles away and he could drop me off there. He didn't reply. I started to feel like something was off. I'm from an area where people go out of their way to help others, but it seemed like too much. I had insisted numerous times that he didn't have to drive nearly 30 miles out of his way to get me gas. He could simply drop me off on his way to his destination, or if he wanted to make sure I made it home fine, he could drop me off at home. In my uneasiness, I started to make small talk. I asked him his name, and his last name was unfamiliar to me, which was surprising but not totally unbelievable, coming from a town of around 3,000 people where I had spent the first decade of my life and where both my parents still worked. I remember wishing that I had paid attention to the construction company name on the side of the truck, since most companies in my area were named after a family. As we got closer to the turn off to my house, I started to get more frantic. I realized that these people, who didn't even seem overly friendly, were insisting that we drive completely out of the way, late at night, in a rural community, to fix a fairly common mishap. I had no idea who they were, I had never seen them before. I had no cell phone reception, and their cell phone was undetectable. Even if it wasn't what they were trying to do, making me disappear would be a pretty easy task. I started kind of shrieking that they just dropped me off at my house, but nobody in the car seemed like they heard me. Finally, in a fit of panic, I screamed at the top of my voice, This is my turn! Take me home, please! Take me home right now! Finally, for the first time, the wife spoke up, yelling at the man angrily and somewhat annoyed, Just fucking take her home! Outside of the girls grunting, the car fell silent. He swerved angrily onto my road, pulled into my driveway, let me out and then reversed out of the driveway so fast that his tires spit gravel and I couldn't even see the license plate or the name of the company through the dust. I ran inside and woke up my parents to tell them what happened. They just yelled at me because I was driving past curfew. I don't know for sure what their intentions were. Maybe they just wanted to help, but I felt really uneasy the whole time. Not as scary as some stuff on here, but that's my experience. The office in the middle of nowhere. When I was 19, I worked for a company that allocated labor to rural areas in Australia. Basically what you did was tell them where you were available, 
and they'd send you to a remote farm for a few weeks, where you'd do whatever they needed done. It was hard work and long hours, but good pay and good fun if you got in with a nice group of workers. When this occurred, I was working on a large property, about 9 hours from Sydney City, and the property itself was 40 minutes from the nearest town. In short, it was in the middle of nowhere. I was working at a farm clearing bushland with three other guys my age from the city. Our boss was a guy named Jeremy, who owned the farm and supervised us while helping out with the work. He was pretty laid back, and generally really good to us. This summer in particular was very hot, and the work was hard. So one day when the temperature hit about 30 degrees Celsius, or 100 degrees Fahrenheit, Jeremy decided to give us the afternoon off. He said he knew a water hole on the farm about a 25 minute drive north. I was keen for a swim, but the other guys wanted to relax for the Arvo. So him and I hopped in one of the work trucks and started heading out across the property. It was mostly wide, empty expanses with a few clumps of scattered bushland. Jeremy wasn't much of a talker, so he drove more and less in silence. After about 20 minutes, however, he suddenly parked and jabbed me in the ribs. Do you see that over there, beneath the two dead trees? I should mention that if you're not familiar with inland areas, particularly those in Australia, they are brown or red, mostly flat and bland, meaning any bright colors stick out like a sore thumb. So you can imagine our surprise when we could see a large blue angular structure far off in the distance. We steered in its direction, and as we got closer we realized it was a huge blue shipping container, just sitting in the middle of nowhere. Jeremy was perplexed. I asked him if he knew what it was, but he obviously didn't. He said he hadn't seen it when he drove through the same area about 5 weeks before, and he wanted to go see what it was. As we got closer things got even more bizarre. There was a big diesel generator behind it thumping away, and a CCTV camera on each side. All motion activated so they buzzed from side to side, following us as we moved. I tried to reason with Jeremy, something along the lines of, with all this security someone obviously doesn't want us here, let's just go. He brushed me off however, reminding me that it was his farm, and whoever had put it here was trespassing, so he wanted to go inside. Despite all the surveillance there was only a small padlock on the huge door. He had some bolt cutters in his toolbox, and after a bit of a struggle we broke the lock and went inside. The first thing I noticed was the rush of cold air as we got in. The place was air conditioned, which I must admit was quite pleasant on such a hot day. We searched around for a light switch, but I could already see it was some sort of IT setup. There were flashing LEDs all around the place and the sort of hum you hear when the hard drives are working hard. When we finally switched on the lights, we could see a sophisticated office setup. There were hard drives the size of bar fridges and other computer equipment lining the walls, sometimes piled two or three high plastic storage boxes scattered around the far wall with several desks with a computer monitor arranged in the middle, complete with rolling office chairs. At this stage I felt like I was in one of those nonsensical dreams. This made absolutely no sense. We wandered into the middle and sat down at the desk to see if the computers could give us any idea of what the hell was going on here. My heart was racing and I just wanted to bolt. We had been seen by the CCTV, so if anyone was monitoring they already knew we were here. Jeremy on the other was adamant that we get to the bottom of this. So I put on a brave face and started looking through the computer. This went on for a while, but in short, neither of us had a very high grasp of technology outside of Facebook and Microsoft Word. The best I can describe it from my lay position is that it was an endless list of computer talk. It was like the old Napster or LimeWire download screens looked like. Just constantly picking up and receiving data, then recording it onto several windows. I gave up on the computers and walked cautiously over to the far end of the container to the big pile of storage boxes. By then I was pretty sure no one else was there as there was nowhere to hide really, but I was still incredibly on edge. I decided against my better judgement to see what's inside all these boxes. My brief sift through these boxes still makes me sick to the stomach, but it didn't take long for me to realize that the box was full of posters, DVDs and photos, all of hardcore CP. One thing that still gets to me is that it was all neatly organized into folders and smaller boxes. These people were organized. I immediately recoiled, jumped up and ran over to Jeremy, who could hardly string a sentence together. I said something to the effect of, May get out. CP. Go. Get the fuck up. I dragged him out, composed myself, and managed to explain what I saw. We jumped back into the truck and sped back to the house. The farm had no cell phone reception, and we hadn't bought satellite phones so we had to get back to the landline to call the police. Once we called them they still had to make it all the way to the farm from the nearest police station, which was in a town about a half hour from the town closest to the farm. We waited, talking frantically about what we'd seen until the cops arrived almost an hour later. They arrived with two four-wheel drives, and we jumped in and led them back. This is where it gets worse. By the time we got back, the container door was open and there was a fire inside. We had only two small extinguishers in the car, and these did very little. The fire department took about an hour to get there, by which stage most of the damage was done. An arson report by the federal police found almost no evidence of the computer equipment described. 
and only traces of paper and cardboard. This means that whoever ran it knew we were there and had time to come and remove most of it and get away. There were various ways to get off the property and the landmass was huge, so there was no real way to tell them, since the police hadn't taken us all too seriously in the first instance, probably due to our poor explanation on the phone. Aerial surveillance was also impossible by the time we had pieced it all together. I took a keen interest in following it up, but with no real evidence of who might be responsible, the investigation went cold. I kept in contact with Jeremy, and the shipping container is still there on the farm, as it's too expensive to move. I'll never forget what I saw in those boxes. Stranger under the bed. I am 22, and this incident happened a year and a half ago. I had just moved into my first apartment and was in the process of moving in. The door that led into my apartment locks itself automatically when closed, so I was going to the entrance of the apartment complex to get my mail. While talking on the phone with my boyfriend, I returned to my apartment and sat on the bed, while opening the mail and using the phone. I dropped the phone on the floor and it landed under the bed, so I had to lie on the floor and stretch for it. I saw something that caught my eye. There was someone under my bed. My eyes widened and I choked the urge to scream. The person under my bed was lying still with his back towards me, and his head to his chest, so I couldn't see his face, and he didn't see me. Trying to be rational while so many thoughts rushed through my head, I picked up the phone and said, Sorry, I dropped my phone. I'm just going to take a shower and call you back. The bathroom is right by my bed, so I hastily walked in, quietly locked the door, turned the shower on, jumped out my window and called the police. They told me to wait nearby but go across the street to see if anyone comes out the door to the apartment complex. This was during the summer and it was still light out. I placed myself across the street hiding behind a car while watching my open bathroom window and entry door. I called my boyfriend and he came to me just before the police. I gave them my keys and they went inside. Only moments later, two cops came out holding a thin and tired looking man. His eyes looked crazy, but he didn't try to get away. The policeman that stood beside me and comforted me while the police searched through my house told me that the man sat outside my door with one of my kitchen knives waiting for me to come out. This man had somehow crept in my entry door while I was getting my mail and hid under the bed. The man that was trying to hurt me turned out to be a homeless person and was placed in a mental hospital. My boyfriend moved in with me the very next day. Welcome to the Hotel California. All right, this is an essay, but a lot happens. Bear with me. My next door neighbor's parents moved from India to the UK back in the 60s. After retiring, they made a habit of heading back there every year to visit family and friends, ultimately spending about half their time traveling through India and half their time here. Long story short, one year they invited my family along. I was 15, and I thought it was some badass Viking rock prince because I had long blonde hair and red kerrang. Fun fact, curly hair ruins everything. I look like a fucking cherub. Now. My neighbor's dad had planned this holiday like it's a military campaign. When we arrive, he hands each of us a brown folder containing our itinerary, hotel brochures, money conversion charts, train timetables, four passport photos of ourselves for forms, and a list of names under the header useful people. Forget Viking rock prints. I'm James fucking Bond. Other than the fact that I'm mistaken for a girl on several occasions, I have an amazing time. Until. We rock up to this huge hotel in the middle of the jungle. Honestly, the R's end nowhere. The nearest village is a three hour drive down a dirt road, just before sunset, in the fucking jungle. I pull out the brochure. It'd be safe to say that this place is under new management. There's a single light on about five stories up. As we pull up to the driveway, we spot a group of men cluttered around a large fire. One of them stands and starts shouting something, but is silenced by the guy next to him with a slap to the back of his head. One of the group comes sauntering over and motions our driver to wind down the window. Imagine Alfred Hitchcock as an Indian drug lord, and you'll have a pretty good idea of the man now flapping his jowls through our window. He peers into the back, spots us and cracks the dictionary definition of a shit-eating grin. In broken English, he welcomes us to the hotel, glances over at our reservations, and ushers us into the lobby. This is when shit gets really weird. The place is deserted. Not the staff have gone to bed deserted. It's like whoever was here fucking noped out of this place in a hurry deserted. There were toppled chairs in the lobby. Hitchcock tells us that our rooms aren't ready and offers us some food while we wait. The dining room is huge, empty, and our order is taken by a boy no older than nine, who promptly vanishes closing the doors behind him. We hear a motorcycle engine outside, and an hour later something vaguely resembling our order appears on a variety of mismatched dinnerware. No idea where any of it came from. At this point we are all pretty unnerved, and everyone started making lame jokes to ease the tension. We were only there for one night, everything had been paid in advance and we were a large group, with two people who spoke Hindi and Konkani, so felt pretty sure we could deal with any weirdness. Hitchcock waddles in and takes us to our rooms, every one of them is stripped bare apart from the bed and the bedside tables. 
Exposed wires poke out of the walls where you'd expect a TV or phone, and there are rectangular patches of discolored wallpaper, suggesting that someone finally took a stand against terrible hotel artwork. The only decoration is this creepy little metal horse that is just sitting on one of the bedside tables. I'm sharing with my little bro and insist on taking the bed closest to the door, presumably thinking that I could summon Thor if things got hairy. Hitchcock lingers in our doorway for a while, flashing his pearly browns and giving me the R word eyes. I close the door on him. We dump our bags, check if the door is locked, and have bro chats until we pass out. I wake up to hear the door to my room clicking shut. The door that is no farther than a foot from my bed. Fuck that. I'm no viking rock prince. I'm a flying baby that plays a harp. I cower under the seemingly clean blankets until my heart stops straining to burst out of my ribs and redecorate the ceiling. Stealthily ninja roll out of the bed into the door. The bastard is unlocked. Fuck this. Barricade that shit with a bedside table. Check little bros alive. Get into bed. See our bags. Add them to the barricade. Notice that mine is open. Fuck everything. Nothing is missing. Camera, wallet, clothes. Super secret spy dossier. Everything is intact. I convince myself that I shat my pants over nothing and go back to sleep. Side note, little bro slept through the whole thing. Morning comes and we all want to get out of there as soon as possible. Neighbor's dad kicks off how weird the whole thing is to Hitchcock and gets half of our money back. Excellent. We head outside and my sister points out the charred remains of one of the hotel beds and what's left of a fire pit. Excellent. Turns out that our driver who had a room in the place had decided to sleep in the bus because he didn't want their funny business. Apparently there were people coming and going all night. He woke up to see a guy, nose against the window just staring at him. Driver hit the window and the dude scampered off into the jungle like fucking Mowgli. We give the driver an extra huge tip. Hitchcock waves at us from the lobby, adjusts his crotch, and plots back in. We leave thinking the weirdness is over. About an hour into the journey, I decide to take a look at our itinerary, so I pull out my spy folder. My heart instantly sinks. One of my password photos is gone. A perfect 35 by 45 millimeter rectangle, missing from the corner. Three little viking rock sheriffs stare up at me, warning their fallen brother. I search the folder and ask my parents if they took it for something, starting to lose my shit. Everything from the night before rushes back. I explain what happened, and there's this weird moment of silence while everyone looks at each other. Turns out that everyone heard something outside of their door at some point during the night, but I deadbolted them before going to sleep. Bro and I had no deadbolt. Hitchcock put us in that fucking room on purpose. Driver suggests that we head back to the hotel and demand satisfaction. Tips galore for the driver. We arrive at the hotel, the doors are padlocked, and Hitchcock and his cronies have vanished. The cherry on top of this mindfuck cake is the horse. The little metal horse that sat on our bedside table has been placed on the step in front of the doors. I took it. Free souvenir. Fuck you, Hitchcock. I know that a lot of you are going to want to see the creepy little fucker, but I don't have it where I'm living at the moment. I think he promised I'll post a photo when I go home for Christmas. First things first, I'm so sorry. I can only imagine the heartbreak and disappointment you felt on Christmas morning as you raced downstairs, ignored all your presents and loved ones and flung yourselves in front of the computer ready to revel in the malicious majesty of Gripona, stalker horse. Long story short, my iPad died, and then my dog died, and then every train service in the UK died. It's been a long festive season. Fuck this shit, where's the horse? Everyone. I'm glad you asked. Right here. His brother's house. I've been lurking on this subreddit for about a week, and I finally decided to post my experience. I'm from a small town in Appalachia, with a population of less than 7,000. There were about 80 people in my high school class, and people are generally very trusting. This story took place early last September, so it would have been a little less than a year ago. I was a 20-year-old male at the time, and I just entered my junior year in college. In high school, I had a close cohort of friends. There were about eight of us that were very close. As things go, Things changed and we went on to our respective colleges. I fell out of touch with many of them, but I did retain contact with a couple of them. The ones featuring in the story are Mac and Devin. Last September, I got a call from my mother telling me the news. Devin's father had been killed in an accident on his way to work. It was a sudden brutal collision, involving a semi. Devin's family was not from the area. They had moved to my town during high school because her father had gotten a job there. Having no family and a dispersed set of friends, she didn't have many people to lean on during this time. Mac contacted me and wanted to know whether I planned on attending the funeral, which had been planned for Friday morning. I had an important class Friday afternoon, but I told him that I could come up that evening and we could occupy Devon. Mac made the six-hour drive from his college to attend the funeral, and I made it into town later that evening. We decided that the three of us would spend a few hours at Mac's house. We were just going to hang out, and Mac and I were determined to preoccupy Devon. I got there around six and we jumped right into it. 
We talked about college, we watched Netflix, and we played board games. Despite the circumstances, it was a pretty good night. I got up to leave about a half hour after midnight. After some tearful goodbyes, I got in my car. Now for a little geography. Max's house is a little more than a mile from my parents' house. There are no red lights and one stop sign. At the time of night, I could make the trip in less than two minutes. Being in a rural part of Appalachia though, the roads were far from straight. In fact, Max's house was just off a winding two-lane road. There were several blind curves that would stop you from seeing what's coming up ahead. And there were no guardrails or streetlights to speak of. So I start off on what I thought would be a brief, uneventful journey home. I just pull out of his driveway and start on my way. I start onto the first blind curve and I'm greeted by something entirely unexpected. I see the car first. It's a white older model sedan. It is in half my lane and half the culvert. I have to swerve to avoid hitting it, and I notice a figure waving his arms as I slam on the brakes. I end up stopped on the side of the road. There's no shoulder, so my car is sitting in the road and in the grass about 100 feet past this car. At this point, I should have kept going and called the police for help when I got home, but this is not what I did. I avoided that feeling in my gut, put my car in park and opened the door. I stepped outside and immediately noticed the damage to the vehicle. The front end had serious damage. There were no other cars around, so I conclude that the driver must have collided with the cliffside on the other side of the road. It is really dark though, so I have a hard time figuring out what happened. At the red light emitted by my taillights, I see the figure approaching me. Hey, buddy, I need some help. What happened? Is there someone you'd like me to call? No, I tried to call my brother, but he didn't answer. He lives just up the road. Oh, do you want me to call the police? No, you can't call the police. I just need my car pulled out of there. He points to the culvert. I need someone with a truck. My brother has one. He's walking closer to me, and I'm beginning to make out some of his features. He's a little bit shorter than me, but he easily has 75 pounds on me. At this point, the little light left me unable to discern much else, except that he was wearing a baseball cap. Well, I don't have a truck, so I guess I can't help you. I was beginning to feel very uncomfortable. He kept approaching me, and there was something wrong in his voice. The flatness, like he was not emotional at all about the predicament he was in. I started to walk backwards towards my car door, drive me to my brother's house. He lives just up the road. He points in the opposite direction of my home as he walks towards my passenger side. I have to get home. My family is expecting me. This is a lie. They have been asleep for hours, and I was still at Max's house for all they knew. It'll just take a minute. He lives on Road Road. His house is only about a mile away. He keeps progressing. My heart is racing, but I am in a strange predicament. I want to get the hell out of there, but there isn't an ideal way to do it. My car doors are unlocked, and he was getting very close to my car. Being as fast as possible, I couldn't get in and lock the door before he opened the door on the other side. I certainly couldn't put it in drive and pull away before he had at least some of himself in my passenger seat. Seeing as how he was going to get into my car if he wanted to, I decided to go the cordial route. If this was going to happen, it was going to be on my terms. I knew Road Road. My sister's boyfriend lived there, and I knew that it was less than a mile from where I currently sat. It was a one-lane holler, as we colloquially refer to a hollow. Maybe he was telling the truth. Maybe I was about to do a good deed. Okay, get in. He sits down in my passenger seat about the time I make it to the driver's seat. Since the doors were open, my car's interior lights were on. This was the first good look I had at him. He was older than me, probably in his late 40s. He was dirty, very dirty. His hands were greasy, his shirt was full of holes, and there were literally flies congregating around him. My car instantly smelled like body odor and bodily fluids. I experienced immediate regret. This was a horrible idea. My parents taught me about this. My mother was a true crime junkie, and she would always warn about situations like this. He closes his doors and the lights go out. I make a U-turn and start heading toward Road Road. He insists on talking to me, although I much rather prefer the hum of the radio. He asks me my name. He asks me where I live. He asks me what I do. They evade every question I deem too personal, for I did not want him knowing too much about me. I begin to get the distinct feeling that something is wrong with him. He speaks void of emotion or any kind of reflection. Sometimes he has a hard time getting the words out. I conclude he's either on a mind-altering substance, or he is playing with less than a full deck of cards. We are turning on Road Road, and he begins admiring my car. It is a fairly nice foreign car that my parents bought for my 16th birthday. He's rubbing the dashboard with his greasy hand before he starts pressing buttons. This is a nice car. A really nice car. I'd kill to have a car like this. I kid you not, he literally said he would kill for my car. I didn't immediately take it as a threat, as there was absolutely no motion in that statement, and it is a common turn of phrase. Nevertheless, I was getting very uncomfortable. My sister's boyfriend's house is just barely in sight. I am so worked up that I decide I'm going to stop there. I'm pretty sure I could get a few beats in on the door before the guy attacks me for not taking him to his brother's place. As I approach his driveway, my heart sinks. There are no cars there, and there isn't a garage. No one's home. 
I'm on my own. As he passes the driveway, he says something that catches me off guard. His house is about a mile up ahead. I thought his house was a mile from your car. No, it's a mile from here. Okay. I keep driving, but I look at my odometer. I'm giving him one mile. That's it. We drive in silence for which I'm grateful. He's still following my dashboard, but I figure I can ignore that. We go about three quarters of a mile further up this desolate hollow. When I ask him how much further, I think he can tell I'm getting irritated and scared. Just up that way, turn right. I stop in the middle of the abandoned road. He's pointing to this gravel road on my right. It's barely wide enough for my car, and it shoots steeply up the mountain. He lives a mile up that road, go that way. There's no way I was about to drive further into this desolate place when it seemed like he was making up directions as he went. There was no sign of life up there, and we had already gone further than he originally said. No, this is as far as we go, I say to him. Get out. No. Come on, man. We're almost there. Just turn up that way. I look around, and I have limited options when it comes to a weapon. In fact, I have one option. The previous winter had been a bad one, so I kept a brush and ice scraper combo in my floorboard. It was plastic, but decently heavy. The scraper part had a sharp edge. I casually pick it up and sit it in my lap. No. Get out. He was very reluctant. My makeshift weapon and the fact that I was literally in the driver's seat caused him to swing his door open. The lights instantly came on, and he turned to look me squarely in the face. He was grinning, and his teeth looked as if he hadn't seen the dentist since before I was born. Please? This was the first time anything he said had any inflection at all. He said it as if he was trying to sound pitiful, but it came off as mocking. No, I said sternly, and began to get out of the car. He was in the process of closing the door when he said one more thing. He leaned into the open door and said, I really like your car. He slammed the door and I took off. It was a one lane road, so I couldn't immediately go the direction that I needed to. I went up a couple hundred feet and turned into someone's driveway. When I approached where I left him out, I see that he has made no progress up the gravel road towards his brother's house. In fact, it doesn't look like he's moved at all. I slow down when I get close to him. I don't want to risk the man jumping in front of me or anything. He stares at me as I pass and I floor it. As I drive away, I can barely make out that he started to walk. Not up to the mountain, not further into the hollow, but towards the way I had driven, towards the main road. The wrecked car was still there when I drove by. I went straight home and laid in my bed, too terrified to sleep. I don't know what he had planned, but I'm pretty sure I wasn't driving him to his brother's house.